in this video, we're going to take a, a look inside the atom. So we're going to think about how many electrons and protons and neutrons are found in a single atom, in a general atom, and what do those look like? So the first thing is there are subatomic particles. And so all atoms contain protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so protons and neutrons have similar masses, as we can see here, highlighted in red. And the electron has a much, much smaller mass. Typically, the mass of an electron is reported at 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31. And so these masses show you that the proton and the neutron are roughly the same, and the electron is much, much smaller. And so the reality is, when we think about this, those masses are quite small. And so chemists developed a different system of using one AMU. Now, one AMU is one atomic mass unit. And so the atomic mass unit is equal to 1 12th the mass of a carbon atom. And so a carbon atom has some protons, neutrons, and electrons. And it turns out that the proton and the neutron are roughly about 1 AMU. And the electron is much, much less than that. We can also see the charges on these three, as shown here in this green box. We can see that the proton is positive, the neutron is neutral, and the electron is negative. We'll also note that the charges, whether it is proton or electron, are identical and opposite. So when we think about this, these are the subatomic particles that you find inside an atom. Now there are other sub subatomic particles, but for the purposes of these videos, we're gonna stick to these three. So the question is, how can we identify an atom? If you have a lot of an element, you can start to think about global properties. But what about if you just have one atom? So one thing that's important is that all elements are naturally neutral, or they have no charge. And that means that the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. So protons equal electrons. And so Dalton's atomic theory said that all elements are distinguishable and the number of protons can be used to identify the element. And so no two, elect no two elements have the same number of protons in general. And so the number of protons is considered the atomic number Z. And so the atomic number can be found on the periodic table. So each element has a unique symbol. So if we were to look at the periodic table in a box, we might have that potassium has the number 19. And this number right here is the atomic number. And the atomic number tells you how many protons there are. It also tells you how many electrons there are in the neutral atom. So each element has this unique symbol. There is additional information that we will meet later on this, either this video or the next video, such as numbers that live in the bottom, which correspond to mass, and other numbers. So if we look at a periodic table, we can look at any element, we'll add potassium back. And so the number for potassium is 19. This number tells you how many protons there are. So if you look at the periodic table and look for element number nine, you're gonna find fluorine. And so we can look across the periodic table and the best part is they are in order. They go from one to 118, pretty much in order. So element 91 is found in the low, low part of the periodic table. We will come to know those as the actinide series. And that is the element protactinium. And element 17 is chlorine. So chlorine has 17 protons and 17 electrons. 
The same can be said for how many protons does any given element have. Once we can identify them, so underneath the symbol is often the name, And we should start to familiarize ourselves with those by looking at different periodic tables. So for iron, which elemental symbol is It has 26 protons. Strontium, which is SR, can be found on the left side of the periodic table and it has 38. Lead, which has the symbol of PB, is element 82, and so it has 82 protons. So for any element on the periodic table, we can easily determine the number of protons based on the atomic number, which is the number seen right here, usually in the upper left-hand side of the box. So all of these elements have the same number of protons as electrons. The reality is the neutrons can affect these elements. And so each atom of a neutral element has the same number of electrons as protons. However, they don't all have the same number of neutrons. So neon, which is element 10. So this, if we were to look at neon, it says 10 here and E. And so neon has 10 protons and 10 electrons, but it could have 10, 11, or 12 isotopes. So, or 10, 11, or 12 neutrons, these are isotopes. So isotopes mean that different atoms have slightly different weights. These are based on how many neutrons they have. Now we'll come to see in later videos that different isotopes can have different properties. So some of them can be radioactive, some of them can have other types of properties. So all of the isotopes add up to 100% abundance. So some elements only have one isotope, some have several. And so we can tell the isotopes apart by their mass number. Now in this periodic table acronym, it tells us how many protons and electrons there are. It doesn't tell us how many neutrons there are. So in order to see that, we actually need to see something that looks a little bit like this. So we'll have an element where A is the mass number. And down at the bottom is the atomic number. Most of the time, the atomic number is not present. So typically what we would see is something where you would have just the mass number at the top. So let's look at a couple of different examples. So for neon, you can have neon 20, neon 21, neon 22. In addition to that, we could also just omit the tens at the bottom to where you just have the upper levels. So all of these isotopes have the same behavior because they are all part of the same element. They just have slightly different masses. So let's think about practical examples. So for any element, as long as we have the mass number, which you can see in this table in the upper left side, we can tell how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are there, there are. So for chromium, it's element CR. So the name of this is chromium. So when we find it on the periodic table, it's element 24, and that means it has 24 protons and 24 electrons. Now the mass number is shown as the 52 here. So 52 is equal to 24 minus the number of neutrons, or plus the number of neutrons, sorry. So it would be the mass number, 52 minus 24, and that gives you 28. What about for potassium? So for potassium, it's element 19. That means it has 19 protons, 19 electrons. The number of neutrons is 39 minus 19, which gives you 20. 
So you need the mass number in order to figure out the number of neutrons. Or you can figure out the neutrons by adding up the protons and the neutrons. So, so far we've really looked at neutral atoms. And so we want to start to think about what happens if an element gains or loses neutrons. So we are going to encounter charged species all semester long. And so those charges are either going to be negative or positive. And those are ions. And elements can gain or lose electrons, only electrons. For an example, we could have lithium, which is lithium plus, plus one E minus. We could also have chlorine plus one E minus, and that would give us chlorine minus. So a positive ion is a cation. And a negative ion is an anion. And so we want to be able to remember that. So there are a couple of different ways that you can do that. We can think that a cation is positive. I also like to remind myself that right in the middle of the cation, there is a T, which looks kind of like a plus sign. So either way, we can remember that a cation is positive. Now, a negative ion has an in in the middle for negative, or anion kind of sounds like if you mushed up weirdly the words a negative ion. So now we've met our cations and anions. So for these two components, we can think about how these charged species were made. So nitrogen, three minus, is a charged ion. So the question becomes, how many electrons does it have? So nitrogen typically has seven plus three, and we got the plus three because it's a three negative. And so that's gonna equal 10 electrons because the neutral nitrogen has taken on three additional electrons to become a negative three ion. For calcium, it's lost two electrons in order to become two positive. So when it does that, it now has 18. So it was 20, minus two, and that equals 18 electrons. So when we start to think about this, we're gonna think about how, what trends give rise to this behavior. And can we start to predict which elements are which? So in 1989, Mendeleev noticed that the elements have similar properties, and he wanted to make a system, an organizational system. And so today, we know this as the periodic table. You likely have a copy sitting next to you or one nearby that you, are, you can look at. So in Mendeleev's original tables, it was actually set up a little differently. So Mendeleev had a long table and noticed that if you looked at them in range of increasing by mass, he started to see the same properties behave over and over again. And so he took this and it's been reorganized into a system that looks a little bit more like we're familiar with. So we made a table where the behaviors interact with one another. And so what we see is this periodic table. So he took a linear system and created a table with not the full number of elements. But one of the things that's more interesting about Mendeleev's table is he left space for elements that people went on to discover. And so this periodic table was the original precursor to the periodic table that we know today that looks a little bit more like this where we have a large section, and we're gonna look at what this looks like and how we can use that on the next slide. So the organization of the periodic table. So I'm gonna draw it out. So you can look at a periodic table. I'm gonna annotate this a little, diff not differently, but just kind of add in a little extra information. So a periodic table that looks something like this. And typically there's 
hydrogen and helium hanging out up here. So if we draw lines here, these elements in the middle are going to be called the transition metals. These, we will often think of them as the no rules kids. They have rules, they're just quite different. So I'm going to draw a circle or use red to roughly outline the metals that we're going to meet. This is not directly to scale, but most of what you can find in this box is a metal. Let's Over here in the light green, we're gonna make some non-metals. And there's an interface where the red and the green, where we can have some sort of transition metal, not transition metals, colloidal metals, things that have multiple behaviors. So these are our non-metals. And so element one is here, and element 118 is actually here. And so these down here, are a little bit different. So when we look at our periodic table, we tend to think about organizational methods. So when we talk about them, there are two different ways we think about that. We can read across, and this is a period. And so if you count the number of rows, essentially in your periodic table, there are seven. If we wanna talk about elements that are organized up and down this direction, these are called groups. And so the groups, if you look on top of a periodic table, are either numbered 1 through 18, or you might see 1 through 8 and 1 through 8 again. So typically we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, oops, 7, 8 across the top. And then down here, these are the transition metals are typically annotated slightly differently. So it turns out that with this information, there are some of these that we want to make sure that we've already met. So group one, these are the alkali metals. And they contain things like lithium, sodium, potassium. Group two, are the alkali earth metals. And it turns out they're slightly less reactive. Another group is group seven, and these are the halogens. That includes things like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. And the last one we want to think about right now are the number eight, group eight, which is the noble gases. And these are relatively inert gases all the way on the right side of the periodic table. So it turns out that we can predict the ionic state of some elements. We can predict for anything that is not a no rules kid. So I'm going to scroll up. And so if we have our periodic table for what's called a main group element, which is basically not a transition metal we can predict the ionic state because the ionic state is the number of electrons gained or lost to have the same number as a noble gas. So for instance, something in group one here needs to lose one electron to have the same number as the noble gas here. So all elements in, the, in group one minus hydrogen want to lose one electron to give them a plus one charge. Group two loses two electrons. Group three loses three electrons. Now, group four actually could gain 
or could lose four electrons. And then the numbers repeat back across. And so I'm going to give myself a little bit more space, try not to cram all of the data. And then from here where nitrogen is, it's going to gain three, two, one. And here, where I obviously run out of space again, are our noble gas. And so we want to gain or lose, and you can lose electrons to reach the noble gas on the previous row, or you can gain electrons to go fast, go across. The transition metal don't follow these same rules, and we will talk about those in a later video. So the last thing we want to think about is just to remind ourselves that they will gain or lose electrons to have the same number as the closest noble gas. And so based on their location, we can think about what is the charge of an ion for the following elements. So strontium is in group two, which means it's gonna lose two electrons. So that's gonna be a two plus. Selenium is a group six, which is on the right side of the periodic table. So it's gonna be a two minus. Phosphorus is in group five, so it's going to lose three electrons. Aluminum is group three, so it will gain. Or Phosphorus gains three electrons to be negative. Aluminum loses three to be three positive. So we want to make a note to ourselves that charges are written the number, so three minus or three plus. We never write them as the plus sign followed by that number. So the ionic state can be predicted based on what we can see or find in the periodic table.